Uh, I'll tell you about something that I consider very interesting in uh, uh, in the arena of sort of algorithmic uh, results in coding theory. Um, this is based on some work of uh, Swastik Koparty, Shubhangi Saraf, and Sergey Ekhanen. Uh, Swastik and Shubhangi were students at MIT in those days, I think, but uh, uh, all this work was done at Microsoft in Silicon Valley. So uh, let me start with a very gentle introduction to error correcting codes. These are objects, combinatorial objects that we use to store uh, and uh, recover information under the presence of noise. And uh, the basic uh, uh, notation that we will be using today is that there is an encoding function which takes some message, uh, uh, let me in fact in include the, uh, the terminology here. So there is a domain of this encoding function which is what we call the set of messages and this encoding function takes the set of messages, it is an injective map but it is in fact going into a much much larger space, n is much larger than k and uh, so uh, the, the set of things that you map to over here, the ones that actually have pre images are what we call the code words. And uh, now the rate of a particular code is this ratio of k over n and in codes that we like to design and use we would like this quantity to be as high as possible. Uh, just to give you a sense, I think uh, every uh, sort of storage DV, uh, media that we know of today uses some form of error correction and uh, pretty much all of them are working with explicit you know, Reed Solomon codes or some variations thereof and the rates are in the 80 to 90 percent regime, so pretty high. Okay. And uh, the distance of a code is in order to make sure that you recover from errors, that you even have the information available to recover from errors, you need to make sure that if you have two different messages, two different elements of sigma to the k, then the encoding maps them to strings which are very far apart. How do you measure how far apart things are? It is this Hamming distance concept. Uh, throughout the talk today we will be normalizing it and this has become more or less the norm in the theoretical computer science literature. Uh, that we talk about the relative distance between x and y is the fraction of coordinates on which they are different. Okay. So this is a very simple notion of a measure, if x and y are different you do not ask how different are they, they are just either equal or not equal. And the minimum distance of a code is this quantity delta of c which is the minimum over all possible distinct messages of the distance between the encoding of the message u and the encoding of the message v. Okay. So this is a uh, a quantity that is fundamental to a code in a sense what it is saying is that if an adversary picks two different messages u and v and wants to confuse you then he can make u, the encoding of u look like the encoding of v by changing only a delta fraction of the, uh, of the symbols. So in the codes of interest we would like rates of codes to be uh, sort of you know we want to asymptotically uh, growing family of codes one for each n let us say and we would like the rate of this, the sequence to be sort of always greater than some fixed constant and the delta also to be greater than some fixed constant. This is what we would like in these codes. So these are the codes that are of interest. Now uh, coding theory has always had associated with it some very basic algorithmic questions and these are you know the first things that you would think of when you say think about its usage in uh, uh, error correction in uh, making information reliable. Uh, you would like to store some information, then you would like to know given that information what sh should I actually store, how should I encode it. So given the message you would like to compute the encoding function E on that message. Uh, a basic task once you have this say a compact disk which on which you have stored information is to say well uh, is it now corrupted or is it reliable that is corresponds to the question of error detection or testing. So if you are given some word W in sigma to the n. Uh, you can ask the question is W a member of this code or not. So that is the very basic version of the question, a more sophisticated version of the question and significantly harder in most cases is to ask the question how far is it from the code. Okay. So what fraction of symbols in W need to be changed in order to get to some string X which is actually in the code. All right. And uh, you can be asked to measure this quantity approximately also, so that is a reasonable thing to ask. These are the kinds of things, questions that we will be 
that sort of hover around the topic of this talk today. And then there is the error correction question which is uh, given this W which is promised not to be too far from the code. So there is a string X such that the distance between W and X is small smaller than some constant delta you can ask the question now compute X for me okay. And we will always consider settings today where this X is determined uniquely because two things any pair of things in the code are sufficiently far you would not have two different elements x1 and x2 which both satisfy this equality that is the choice of delta that we will be working with today. So these things I hope are clear because these are the kinds of questions we will be talking about today. Now uh, so I should say a little bit this, these are the algorithmic questions in coding theory what has happened in the literature on coding theory. Uh, uh, most of the literature started in 1948 and 50 in the works of Shannon and Hamming and uh, Hamming's theory was more or less sort of considered more constructive but really uh, from our point of view there was no algorithmic task that we dealt with particularly efficiently over there. Shannon definitely sort of almost explicitly went for in the non-algorithmic direction and uh, solved every question that was of interest in sort of as much time as he could find. Uh, so exponential double exponential times were all considered fine in that uh, in those original papers. Uh, very soon coding theorists started looking at efficient algorithms for uh, some of these coding tasks and coding typically ended up being very efficient for most codes that were of interest because very often this encoding map is would be some linear map it is just given by matrix multiplication. So it is efficient in the sense of being at least polynomial time. Uh, the first polynomial time algorithms for decoding codes which were sort of in this range of parameters uh, happened in about 1966 due to a result of Forney and uh, he gave some very interesting algorithms at the time over here and uh, subsequently uh, uh, I, uh, maybe Eustacean in about 1972 made these codes very explicit and in the process the decoding algorithms were all polynomial time. Uh, polynomial time might not be efficient enough for some of these tasks for us so what about making it say linear time that was done mostly by Spielman and by Sipser and Spielman uh, who showed constructions of codes for which you could do all of these things in linear time encoding could be done in linear time and for certain constants delta over here the error detection and the error correction question could also be solved in linear time. So we might say this is the end of the story but no we can go much further which is what leads us to sublinear algorithmics we would want algorithms which run in time even less than linear in the input size or the output size. So if I give you a generic function mapping say a bits to b bits can this function be actually computed in time which is little o of a and b. So this is the generic question that was that is typically asked in sublinear time algorithmics and the obvious answer is of course no but we do not like this answer. So we will go to something else and we will say okay how should I change the question so as to get the answer that we like the answer that we like is yes. So and sublinear time algorithmics pretty much says these are you know some basic conditions are necessary and very often they are also sufficient. So what are these conditions well you do not want in this setting to ask to output a long string of length b but you just say can I determine any coordinate of this string in uh, efficiently. So now there goes your b as a lower bound on the running time so maybe you can go little low of b. Uh, similarly you can do something very similar to the input you can say rather than saying that the input is given as a long string given on a Turing tape let us use a compact disc or some you know, random access device an oracle and so we replace the input by an oracle and now you get to ask questions what is the jth coordinate of this x and you get back as answer x sub j. So now you do not have to read the entire input either it is available if you want to ask if it is relevant to a given answer maybe you read it okay. So an easy function to compute this way in sublinear time is the identity function which says given i output x sub i very efficiently knowable okay. However uh, for more sophisticated tasks this is not usually good enough so one tends to have one more weakness or weakening rather than saying that I will compute the function f on the input that is given to me I will say I would have I have computed the in function f on some input which is very close 
to the input that is actually given to me. So x tilde is going to be some string which is close to this x that is given and that is all I will guarantee. Okay. So you weaken your guarantee this way and once you rephrase your question with these three caveats many many interesting tasks can be solved in sublinear time. So here is a very brief history of what where these kinds of uh, uh, results were first studied. Uh, Blum and Kanan and then uh, uh, Blum and Kanan sorry uh, and Blum, Luby and Rubenfeld uh, initiated these kinds of questions in the context of what is called program checking. They were looking at a program as implicitly representing a large function say uh, look let us look at the truth table of this program on all, every n bit string as a possible input. Well this is a 2 to the n bit string as a thing and you want to say well is it computing the correct n bit string 2 to the n bit string. So in that sense it makes sense to say well I do not want to take time which is polynomial in 2 to the n I want time which is polynomial in n and uh, those are the kinds of things that they were looking at and then Blum, Luby and Rubenfeld gave many interesting extensions. These kinds of questions were also looked at in the context of what is called interactive proofs of probabilistically checkable proofs by Babai, Fortno and Lund about the same time 1988, 1990 etc. And uh, many interesting algorithms have been developed in the last 20 years for a large collection of uh, graph theoretic properties for things like sorting and searching etc. Uh, lots of statistics, entropy computations, high dimensional computational geometry. Uh, many of these different arenas have now started seeing algorithms which are running in sublinear time in the length of the input. Uh, a very interesting thing is actually before almost all of these things started happening we started seeing coding theoretic results. In coding theory there is a very happy marriage of uh, you know relevance of this question. I mean imagine you have this uh, uh, you know uh, I have the stick which has about 32 gigs of uh, storage in it. If I wanted to rewrite everything on it or read everything that is on this particular USB stick it would take probably my laptop about 10 minutes and I do not know exactly I did not do a particular you know I have never actually done this computation but it is probably 10 minutes of time. And you might want to say well look suppose I wanted to uh, find out if all this information on this disk is sort of intact is it correct or is there too many errors in it. It makes a lot of sense to ask this question can I detect errors very quickly I do not want to take 10 minutes to figure out if this thing is roughly okay or not I would like to do it rapidly. Or alternately I want to read a particular file which is stored on this disk I do not want to sort of read the entire information on this uh, disk or stick and uh, decode it okay. So these kinds of questions make a lot of sense so let us ask the question what happens when you mix sublinear time algorithms and coding theory. The three basic tasks that we considered encoding, decoding and codes let us see what happens to them. Encoding it turns out it is not reasonable to expect anything to happen in sublinear time why well the very aspect of the, uh, the nature of the question is such that you should not be able to do anything efficiently. Why? I want to change one bit of the message or if I want to change the message which is stored on the disk you know, the information that is on the disk in one coordinate or any number of coordinates it does not matter. The properties of the error correcting code say that you must change at least 10 percent of the stick right. Now 10 percent of the stick is not little o of the length of the stick so I cannot get little o of n for encoding that is pretty much ruled out by definition of the problem. On the other hand the two other questions that we thought, thought about so I give you the stick and I say is there too much errors or is that not that is a testing question that makes a lot of sense to do in sublinear time and it can be done for many interesting codes and this was a large collection of initial results. And then uh, how about decoding saying well I want to recover some particular file on this disk can I do it efficiently. Once again there are many interesting codes for which this can be done and the codes that admit efficient testing are what are called locally testable codes in the literature and they are extensively studied. There is an almost parallel body of work with some initial overlap but pretty soon there is divergence is a collection of codes which are called locally decodable codes where you can actually recover the information efficiently if you know that the number of errors is small. Now for various technical reasons these two questions do not turn out to be the same. In this talk today I will be talking mostly about locally decodable codes. The codes that I am that we will describe explicitly in the new results I, we suspect are also locally testable which is nobody is bothered to prove that yet and 
seems to be a question of lesser interest, but uh, uh, certainly we uh, I mean uh, the, the, what we will be focusing on is on that aspect. For a little while I will also talk to you about uh, locally testable codes, maybe there will be one slide on when why we started looking at these things. Okay, so in the rest of the talk I will give you the definition of what is a locally testable decodable code formally. So it is it's a combination of the decoding question and the sublinear time algorithmics, but let us put the two together and make sure the question is precise. Uh, I will give you some background, some basic construction and sort of describe a particular barrier that we were seeing in the past and uh, then I will describe these recent constructions which are very beautiful. Uh, I, I feel they are sort of really remarkably surprising, I mean they, they were very surprising when I first realized that these things existed, but they are remarkably simple at the same time which is sort of a very nice combination. You get surprised by something which is very simple and uh, so let us start with the definitions. So a code. C with its encoding associated encoding function, we will keep sort of switching back and forth between the encoding and the code itself is what is called decodable with delta fraction errors with L of n queries let us say or L of n locality. Uh, if there exists an algorithm, a decoding algorithm D which does the following, it is given as input a coordinate that you want to recover and this will be a coordinate of the message saying here is a message which was encoded. I want it to know its ith coordinate and you are given an oracle for a corrupted encoding of this information. So w is an oracle is a function which maps the coordinates 1 through n to some letter of the alphabet. So you have oracle access to this function you ask for w of j you get back some letter of the alphabet and says this is what is written in the jth coordinate of the string. And uh, the promise is that there is some message whose encoding is sort of at most delta far from the uh, uh, from the string that is written on over here w the string that is written down okay. And what this decoder should do is output the ith coordinate of the message m okay m sub i and it should do so it is allowed to be probabilistic but its error probability should be uh, bounded away from one half so at most one third. So at least one two thirds probability you get the right answer and if you want you can sort of boost this up. Uh, by repetition okay. And the important parameter here is this locality how many queries are you allowed it is only L queries to the oracle for W okay. So this is the concept of interest and this is what we are going to be talking about today okay. Does this make sense? All right. So what is the history? Now turns out even in 19 I think this is 1950 and 1955 are these two papers it is really old papers Reed and Muller two different papers Reed I think defined the code and then Muller gave the decoding algorithm. These are called Reed Muller codes. These codes were actually, in a sense, in spirit, these were local decoding algorithms. Now, the, the fact that these were local decoding algorithms is very, very, very implicit in the paper. You know, it is somewhere buried in the analysis. Uh, so, we would not probably call it a proper, you know, well written proof for local decodability, but the, the intuition is there. It is a simple enough uh, property that it does uh, simple enough code and the simple enough decoding algorithm that you can verify that it would satisfy all the expectations that you would have. Uh, the modern era started with the uh, work of Babai, Fortno, Lund and Segedi in 1990 who basically started establishing in fact probably were one of the uh, first set of uh, papers to start connecting up computer science to coding theory significantly. Uh, I'm sorry, that should have been Levin, not Lund. And Levin is, in fact, one of the uh, uh, principal uh, 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 people behind this marriage of the two theories of error correcting codes and uh, uh, and theoretical computer science. So, sorry about that. That should have been Levin. Uh, so, the construction and the implied definitions, but even you know, while they gave constructions which were clearly satisfying the axioms of uh, locality and so on the definitions were very very implicit and uh, it took a much longer time before so uh, in some work with Trevisan and Vadal and then later uh, Katz and Trevisan two different motivations we actually gave explicit definitions of locally decodable codes. The reason we came up with this definition here was to show that any locally decodable code was usable to get some complexity theoretic effects. So 
usually a good reason for you to be able to define what is a locally decodable code to be able to say for every locally decodable code you get something interesting. And Katz and Trevisan also had this reason to define it they said well every locally decodable code shows some limitations which uh, so some limitations on its rate uh, and so on. So these are two reasons to introduce definitions whenever you see a for all quantifier you need to know what it is it quantifying over so you have to have a definition. So these things sort of happened in around 2000 and in between there were many constructions by the way between 1990 and 2000 there were many constructions of these objects but nobody bothered to define them. All right so why were people going around working with these codes? So let me start with locally testable codes very briefly. Uh, there are these objects that we have been studying extensively and uh, uh, called probabilistically checkable proofs and these are intimately related to uh, combinatorial optimization and our ability to understand why they cannot be solved well approximately in some in many cases. Uh, PCPs it turns out are sort of complexity theoretic analogs of locally testable codes. Locally testable codes are com combinatorial objects. PCPs are their complexity theoretic analogs there is a very 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 close relationship between them but it is not formal. So there is no theorem which says a PCP existence of a PCP implies the existence of a LTC with corresponding parameters there is no theorem which goes in the other direction but these two objects have been very intimately connected with each other right? every time we want to construct a PCP we look around try to find a good locally testable code and vice versa every time we find a PCP of some different parameters we say oh could I have also gotten a locally testable code by these things. Uh, the current state of the art over here is pretty good but not great. Uh, so you can find codes which are testable with just constant number of queries. So the number of queries that you make into these objects is a constant independent of the message length which is remarkable and uh, the, the penalty that you pay is not not linear which is what coding theorists would really really love but right now the best ones are coming pretty close. So k bits of message would be mapped to k times polylog k bits of encoding okay. and this is pretty strong uh, results over here. Uh, this thing was based on some work with Ben Sasson uh, and comes up in the paper of Iridia Noor. Now this is all I am going to say about locally testable codes. The objects that we are going to be interested from now on are going to be these locally decodable codes and these are the ones where you say well I want to recover some coordinate of the message and I would like to do that quickly. What do we know about them? Here are some sort of complexity theory cryptographic motivations for studying locally decodable codes. This is what they have been used for in the literature so far. There is a result uh, going back to I think observations of Level uh, and then Russell M. Pagliazzo and then I formalized this in some surveys. Uh, which says that well whenever you want to construct so, so complexity theory is often asking questions like how can I create a function which is very hard. Now if I give you a general n bit function which is hard can I create a function which is boolean which is sort of relatedly hard about as hard represents the essence of the hardness of this thing. This is a study which has been very important and useful in cryptography in the foundations of cryptography it leads to something called hardcore predicates and turns out locally decodable codes are very useful in getting a very modular reduction uh, between these two classes of questions. I will not define them but just uh, I want to make a point which I will get to shortly. They have also been used in creating what is called hardness amplification I start with a function which I know to be hard on worst case instances I would like to get a function now which is hard even when I pick random inputs to the problem. How can I do it? Well coding theory comes in useful over here you build sufficiently good locally decodable codes they lead to constructions of these things. Uh, another application of locally decodable codes has been in schemes called for private information retrieval. I would like to uh, store information in multiple databases which are not pairwise not talking to each other and recover some information from these databases say I want to do a patent search and I want to find out about what is the sort of uh, what is known about the utility of using aspirin to solve for certain forms of cancer well maybe I do not want to reveal the nature of the query to these patent search engines because then they might figure out uh, oh this might be an interesting ploy and if uh, Microsoft is interested in it maybe we should be too. So we would like to hide our queries and uh, private information retrieval schemes are designed to do that. 
and they again turn out to have an intimate connection to locally decodable codes. So what is the point of all of these things, all of these applications they are all basically disabling results, they are not enabling results okay. Each one of these says locally decodable codes can be used to not do something I mean or to let create a system where you cannot do something. What about the more obvious application that we thought about saying look I have the stick and it has a lot of information and I would like to recover information quickly. We have never ever you know other than the theoretical possibility that you could use codes to do this uh, we have never actually I mean this has never been uh, nobody ever proposes a scheme and says well now I will try to use it in practice. This has not happened so far today's talk I think should change this is really I think a game changer in that sense and why is that and the rate, re reason is very simple the best known locally decodable codes that we knew till now with sublinear time decoding okay had rate at most one half okay 50 percent. So you have some amount of information you have to at least double it when you store things in order to get any local decodability okay you want 51 percent we did not know of a single scheme and in fact you know when you think about this question of local decodability that the message should be recoverable you no matter where there are errors you would really think maybe you know I have I look at the first half of the code there is uh, or you know the first 10 percent of the code I should be able to recover the bit number one I look at the second 10 percent or you know anywhere the errors are I should still be able to recover this information. So the information about this one bit is all over the place you think such a scheme should be inherently redundant and uh, these kinds of you know the constructions that we knew supported this theory. So the best known locality with sublinear decoding and the sublinear that you could get over here was a good sublinear amount not n over log n or n over uh, you know something but square root of n. But if you wanted to do better say I want to do n to the one third well your rate dropped if you want to do n to the point 0.1 your dro rate drops even more and how is the rate well if you want n to the epsilon the rate that you get the ratio of k over uh, n the best known codes had epsilon to the 1 over epsilon. So if you want n to the point 1 as your decoding complexity uh, that is a forbidding rate okay this is like 10 to the 10 at this stage you are not going to be using this code. So clearly all these co the codes that we were looking at were inherently limited from the point of view of anything other than use in complexity theory I mean this is not going to be useful in a practical storage device. So there are some provable lower bounds but they are very weak so Katz and Trevisan showed that uh, if you want to decode with L queries where L could be any function of N but if you put L greater than log N you do not get anything interesting here uh, then you need at least N to the 1 plus 1 over L as the sorry N should be at least K to the 1 plus uh, 1 over L okay N should be uh, K to the 1 plus 1 over L. So if you are thinking of L as some constant I want to recover the information with 15 queries well N has to be at least K to the 16 over 15 okay but that is the most that was known. Uh, it does not rule out anything when you are saying well I want to recover with N to the point 0.1 queries okay there is no lower bounds over here even log N queries in principle you could get linear rate and very very good linear rate and like I mentioned earlier practical settings we are thinking of codes of rate you know 80 percent 90 percent. Now I do not necessarily insist that this is the only reason reasonable rate at which practice could work but that is where they are looking at right now uh, almost any known storage device if it is not using things at this rate I would suspect they are not uh, considered sort of use usable. So what are some basic constructions where did this rate barrier of one half come from so let me tell you what these basic constructions are and then move along to the new results okay. So uh, in this talk I will sort of switch from locally decodable codes to an even stronger concept called self correctable codes what are self correctable codes rather than saying I want to recover one coordinate of the message I will say I want to recover one coordinate of the code word okay. Now this is not a very big difference but it makes things a lot simpler for us when we are explaining things because it is much easier to not worry about how did you represent the message uh, you just say okay look if this is a set of code words then what, what do we what can we do with it 
And so, so it is a simpler concept to look at self correctable codes and it implies the existence of an encoding function that leads to a locally decodable code. So does not uh, really change the question uh, much it just makes it a little bit harder technically supposedly potentially but uh, for all the constructions that we see this is an easier question to describe easier task to describe okay. So this is the concept that we are going to be looking at. Ah, why is this a stronger object? Uh, if you give me an error correcting code and let us say it is a linear error correcting code. So the map from uh, the, the set of code words is linear then there is a subset of coordinates which are so sort of linearly independent. So and if you took this subset of coordinates to be your message locations then there is a linear map E which will map from this set of coordinates to the full thing. And now recovering any subset of the code word any coordinate of the code will in particular rec also recover any coordinate of the message. What makes this easier is in many of these practical uh, uh, these codes that we will be talking about figuring out which subset of coordinates is actually linearly independent takes some work. It is only linear algebra but it takes some work which we do not need to do and we do not want to do. So we would not talk about it okay, okay thanks all right. So this is the concept that we will be talking about and let us describe to you the sort of most basic and interesting uh, uh, class of uh, locally decodable codes. These codes are also known to be locally testable but we would not talk about that today. These codes come from multivariate polynomials and use a very very basic property of multivariate polynomials to prove that they are error correcting codes and relatively elementary property also to prove that they are actually locally decodable. So what is the, uh, the what are these codes described by in order to describe the codes I have to pick three parameters one of these parameters is a finite field a field of size q so f sub q denotes a field of size q then I pick two integers m and d m is the number of variables and d is the degree parameter. The message space the set of all messages is in one to one correspondence with the set of all polynomials in m variables of degree at most d over this field of size q okay. Throughout the talk today I will be uh, sorry throughout this portion the basic portion of the talk I will be talking about polynomials of degree less than q uh, later we will change that. Now the encoding of a message is very simple so the message a message is a polynomial in m variables okay it is degree is at most d which means so the degree of x times y squared is 3 so this is the total degree function. So uh, there are no monomials of degree more than d in this thing. Uh, the encodings is going to be all the, the evaluation of this polynomial over the entire space. Notice we are working over a finite field so there is only finite number of points in the space you evaluate it over the entire field to the m okay, fq to the m. Now the resulting parameters that you get uh, whoops typo the resulting parameters of the code. So what is the length of the code it is q to the m you are evaluating this function everywhere. What is the alphabet I forgot to mention that the alphabet is the finite field every evaluation is some value in the field and uh, what is the dimension of the code how big is the message space well how many coefficients do you have in m variables of degree at most d it is a very simple quantity to compute and it turns out that the number of coefficients is exactly m plus d choose d okay. So, uh, so you get this quantity over here so the message space is m plus d choose d n is q to the m and the distance that you get out of this is at least 1 minus d over q this is this what we call the Schwarzschild lemma in our community so sort of an age old fact about polynomials if I take a degree d non zero polynomial and evaluated at a random point then it will evaluate to 0 with probability at most d over q okay. And that leads immediately to the statement which says that two different polynomials agree with probability at most d over q they disagree on at least 1 minus d over q fraction of the input space okay. So that is the distance now you can also use d greater than q with care in these cases in fact uh, the original paper of Reed and Muller that I described did do it they use the original Reed Muller codes were obtained by setting q equal to 2 over here but d much larger so. 
So, where do you get local? So, we have analyzed all the classical parameters, the rate is whatever k over n you get, and we will talk about it in explicit cases shortly. Uh, the distance is 1 minus d over q. If you want this quantity to be some absolute constant bounded away from 0, then you pick d to be like 1 minus delta times q. Okay, so, so if you bound it away from q, then you get this quantity is some constant, all right. Now, what about locality? How do you do local decoding of the function? So, let us look at the problem statement. What is the problem statement? The so, let us say this is some fq to the m, and what is a code word? A code word is a value on fq written at each one of these points in the space. So there are q to the m points in the space. At each point, at each point, I'll give you a value, saying this is the value of the code word. What's a received word? The word w that we usually talk about. Uh, now I'm talking, calling it some function f. It's the value w, the code word, but it has been corrupted in a few places. Some tiny constant fraction of the places, and let's say sort of pictorially, in this set of locations, its value has been changed. Of course, the decoding algorithm does not know this. It does not know where things have been changed. The recovery question is simple. The self-correction question, what is it? It says, I give you a point. Let us say this particular point, which happens to lie in the corrupted space, but did, could have been somewhere else. And I want to know what is the value of the code word, not the received word at this location. Okay. So I, the reason I put it in the corrupted set is just to make sure you understand that I cannot just read it off from the value of the received word. If I read it from the value of the received word, I will get some corrupted value. Okay. An adversary chooses what is the set of errors and an adversary chooses where I want the recovery to happen. These are for all quantifiers. So I cannot assume that that location will not be an error. Now we want to find out how to decode this thing. How do I find out what is the value of the polynomial p at this point where I have an oracle access to the function f which is usually equal to p but not over here. So the idea over here is very simple. What we will do is pick a random line passing through this point and the random line is a very well defined simple algebraic object. We will look at the function restricted to that line and what happens to the function restricted to the line? It turns out to be a degree d polynomial in one variable. And uh, I will say, okay, let me read the value of this function f everywhere on this line. Okay. So that is q, q queries to the value of this function. q is much smaller than q to the m as long as m is greater than 1. And m greater than 1 will start becoming an important issue later. And uh, so you made q queries. Now you say, well, what do I want to find out? I want to find out what is the value of, a, and if it is a random line, it should not be passing through this uh, orange set too often. It will pass through it. The adversary gets to pick it, but even if the adversary gets to pick it, it cannot make, you know, force too many of these values, uh, uh, too many orange points for too many lines. So for most lines, you get a very few number of orange points. And the question that you are now asked is, can I find the value of the degree d polynomial which tends to agree with the value of f often on this line? And this is a classical decoding question. It's called the decoding of Reed-Solomon codes. It can be solved very efficiently, okay, polynomial time, etc. So you can solve this question easily. And once you solve the question, you say, "I know the value of the function p on this entire line as a polynomial, as an abstract object. I just evaluate it at this point to get the value, and the locality that I get is q, which is n to the one over m. Recall n was q to the m, so it's." So you get n to the 1 over m, which is sublinear, all right. So does this make sense? It's a very simple basic idea in uh, locally decodable codes and uh, works very, very cleanly and the analysis is all very simple. Now question is what kind of parameters do we get? And here are some parameters that we have looked at in the literature. On one extreme you can say what is the maximum locality I can get for a decoding algorithm? And you get locality 2, which is probably the best you can do with anything interesting. Okay. And uh, the locality that you get that way is, uh, so you get two locally decodable codes by getting, setting the degree parameter to 1 and you pick a field of size 2 and uh, your m now, well I need to find enough degrees of freedom 
I need to make sure m plus d choose d is at least k. Well, you just pick m equal to k, and that gives leads to this uh, this value, and uh, n equal to uh, uh, this yields uh, a value of n which is two to the k field size to the power of the number of variables. So k bits get mapped to two to the k bits. That's a huge loss in rate. However, you get two local decodability. Now, for a long time, it was suspected actually that this kind of exponential dependence between n and k is inherent in any local uh, constant query local decoding algorithm. Of course, we were not able to prove it. The lower bounds of Katz and Trevisan basically say that uh, if you want three locally decodable codes, then you know this thing needs to be at least k square or something. So it's very weak. It does not prove anything close to exponential. But it was long suspected, and there was a, another family of breakthrough results in the last uh, five years or so, which led to uh, sub-exponential uh, codes over here. I won't be talking about that today. Uh, how about if we switch from saying, look, I don't care about the best possible locality to, to saying some sublinear locality. How can I get that? Well, like I said, you, you know, your n is q to the m, and the query complexity is q. If you want to get anything sublinear, little o of n, then you need to make m equal to at least 2. So let's take m equal to 2. What do you get? Well, uh, the degree should be sort of bounded away from the field size, or else you don't have distance in the code. So let's say the degree is like 1 minus 2 delta times, so I just called it 2 delta for some reason, because I want to correct delta fraction of errors. And uh, if you do that, the parameters roughly work out to be the following. n is q squared. And k is roughly uh, 1 minus 2 delta times q squared, the whole quantity squared divided by 2. Okay. So d and q are roughly the same, you know, just ignore the delta, set it to 0 for now if you want. But d and q are roughly the same, k is q squared over 2, n is q squared. Okay. So the rate that you can get is at most 1 half. You can get as close to 1 half as you want, you do not even get 1 half. But you can get arbitrarily close and you get a locality of square root of n and that is it. But we cannot go beyond rate 1 half and really there was no idea out there saying how can you go beyond this very simple thing. We came up with lots of very sophisticated nice uh, codes but not in this regime. Okay. The rate 1 half remained intact. And uh, of course like I said yeah, you can get other parameters by just setting m equal to 1 over epsilon, you get locality n to the epsilon at rate epsilon to the 1 over epsilon as I mentioned earlier. So things get worse rapidly. It is also interesting, yeah, square root of n you can get this much, uh, but what if I want cube root of n, the best rate is 1 sixth, etc., etc. So you decay like a factorial. And uh, like I said, yeah, the degree needs to be at most q, m is at least 2 k is at most q squared over 2 and n is q squared. So there is no way we can get rate better than 1 half. And uh, the breakthrough result of uh, Koparty, Saraf and Yekhanen is now you can basically get arbitrarily good rates. So pick your parameter alpha and your rate will be 1 minus alpha. You can pick alpha to be arbitrarily close to 1. Pick your parameter beta again as close to 0 as you want and your decoding complexity local locality will be n to the beta and depending on your choice of alpha and beta the fraction of errors will get smaller and smaller but not ridiculously small. I think delta is like alpha times beta divided by 8 something some fixed constant and uh, you have these codes for every one of these parameters there are codes and any n that you choose there are codes of length n which have rate at least 1 minus alpha and uh, it is n to the beta locally decodable from delta fraction errors. Okay. So very, very beautiful. I mean n to the point 1 you want with rate 99 percent you can get it. Uh, this is the one for which in the past we were thinking of rate 10 to the minus 10. So it is it's definitely very, very uh, strong. And uh, one of the interesting things is I mean so far you know locally decodable codes if somebody said okay give me an example choice of parameters which works. I cannot think of anything interesting that I could convince anybody. Now I think even concrete parameters that are coming out of these codes are actually interesting. So one of the parameters described in the paper roughly suggests the following. 
if I take my USB stick, uh, it's like 32 gig of information, and I decide that I want to implement a locally decodable code over here. I can use rate of about 80 percent or so. I think it's like 70 percent maybe, but uh, in, for the choices that they describe. And uh, what kind of speed ups do I get? Rather than re looking at the entire stick in order to recover all the information on it, uh, to recover from errors in, on this uh, stick, you can do it sort of a 15,000 times faster. Okay. Well, that's a noticeable difference. Rather than 10 minutes, I'll be doing it in microseconds okay, or milliseconds. Sort of. So it's, it's definitely a remarkable improvement. And it's actually sort of numbers which are making sense. So this is the first time that any code has attained this level of uh, uh, efficiency. So what are these codes? And the basic idea is really, yeah, we're just going to work with multivariate polynomials, but we're going to do a little bit more sophisticated things with them. Okay. So rather than just saying encodings are going to be evaluations of the polynomials, I will also encode its partial derivatives. Okay. So why does this, uh, or I will also include the evaluations of its partial derivatives. So this is sounding like a negative. I was already looking at rate at most one half. Now I'm going to give you even more information. How am I going to get higher rate out of this? Well, I'm now going to let the degree grow higher. Previously, I was handicapped by using degree at most half of, at most the field size. Now I'll go up to degree, which is say twice the field size. And why is this okay to use? So for example, if you're looking at uh, a polynomial in two variables, uh, and you ask the question, how, what fraction of points can a polynomial in two variables have both, both evaluate to 0 and have both its partial derivatives, one with respect to x, one with respect to y, evaluate to zeros? Well, this fraction of points is at most the degree of this polynomial divided by 2 times q. Why? Because each one of these zeros counts roughly like two zeros of some function, right? I mean, so if you define the notion of 2 correctly, and, uh, this is what we would get. So you get, you get to use degree of this polynomial which is twice the field size and that starts giving you some things. So let's work out an example over here. Ah, I should mention, so what do we mean by partial derivatives? I won't give a formal definition yet. I might later but I might not. So you should tell me when I should stop by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're not going to do that. Okay, somebody should. Uh, so for every uh, collection. So if I have an m variate polynomial, I say I want to take i1 derivatives in the first variable, i2 def derivatives in the second variable, i sub m derivatives in the nth variable. There is a way of taking derivatives. I will not tell you what they, this is right now. But this such a derivative would be co considered a derivative of order sum of these values, okay, I, I1 to i sub m. And what we can say is a polynomial p vanishes with multiplicity s at some point a1 through am. If it turns out that p of a1 to am is 0, which is the same as saying that its uh, zeroth derivative vanishes, but also all other partial derivatives of order at most uh, s minus 1 vanish at this point. So there is a notion of defining these derivatives and once you define it, this is roughly what the definition corresponds to. And the multiplicity version of the Schwarzschild lemma, which, by the way, I mean, uh, I'm sure it exists in the rich literature on algebra somewhere, but we've never seen it applied in computer science in the past, or even clearly articulated in the coding theory literature in the past. Just says that if you ask the question, so what's the expected multiplicities of a polynomial uh, at a random point in the space? So this is a strict strengthening of the quantities. This is a quantity which is strictly greater than the quantity that Schwarzschild asked. They said, how often is a polynomial 0? Now we are asking at each point we will count how often it is 0 and then ask what is the expectation of this quantity. That quantity is at most the degree of the polynomial over q. Okay. So this is the, the lemma that one can use for this appropriate notion of a derivative. So this sort of should be familiar from your background and analysis. though the notion of a derivative is slightly different. Now given that lemma, this is how one could start constructing an error correcting code, uh, a locally decodable error correcting code. We will choose the bivariate example again. 
I will choose degree roughly, uh, oops, that should have been twice 1 minus delta 2 delta times q. Okay, so, twice q, roughly twice q and I will use multiplicities too and the multiplicity parameter will influence the results in ways that I will describe shortly. Now, this is a code which is not going to be over the alphabet of f q, but rather over 3 tuples of this alphabet. Okay, it is a slight extension, but this kind of cheating is uh, very legitimate and very uh, uh, useful to do in coding theory. It is uh, you can easily derive other interesting results out of this. So, now, so every when I ask what is the value of the code at a particular coordinate, I get 3 values from f q. What is the message? It is still m variate polynomials of degree at most d and recall d is twice q now roughly. Okay. The encoding now is something more. Encoding is the evaluation of a polynomial of its partial derivative with respect to the first variable which I am denoting p sub x and partial derivative with respect to the second variable denoted p sub y all of these evaluated at a and b. So, this 3 tuple associated with a b is considered one coordinate of the code. For every choice of a b I get another such evaluation. So, that gives me a code of length q square. Okay. So, that did not change. Now, the k is not quite d squared over 2 which is what we used to have. It is going to be one third of d squared over 2. Why? d squared over 2 is the number of coefficients, number of values of f q. If I measure that as number of symbols of the alphabet that I am working with, well the symbols of the alphabet is f q cube. Okay. So, so, I have to divide by 3. This 3 is the same as this 3. Okay. And so, I get codes of length 1 third of d squared over 2. And uh, now, if you look at you know d is 2 q. So, you get this is basically 2 times q squared, 2 third q squared is the maximum k I can think of. That is rate 2 thirds. We are already over the 1 third barrier, uh, 1 half barrier. And the uh, question is what about locality? Can we actually decode these codes locally? Okay. So, that is the question that we want to answer and once we do we get sublinear locality at rate greater than 1 half. All right. So, I will do a few slides and then quickly jump to the conclusions. Uh, so, reconstructing this polynomial from uh, at a given point. So, if I have this polynomial p which was my message and I want to evaluate it at a b, how do I do it? So, this is basically the same idea as previously. Uh, so, let us start with assuming there is no errors, but I just want to do a sort of a I want to recover its value from random values of f of a b uh, f rather than from f of a b. So, what do you do? Well, you still decode along lines you pick a random line which is of the form alpha times t plus a beta times t plus a where t is a parameter in the t is a value in the field. If I set t equal to 0 I get the point a b, but other values of t take me to other points in the space. I define the function g of t and this is the polynomial of degree at most d. Okay. If I look at the value of f over the uh, over all choices of t that gives me q evaluations of this polynomial, but q is not sufficient because d is much larger than q, d is like 2 times q. But I also have the derivatives of g I claim. And why is that? Well, the derivative of g, uh, g is a univariate function, its derivative is there is only one derivative it has and uh, that derivative is really alpha times the x derivative of p plus beta times the yth derivative of p. Okay. And notice that on the points on the space I also get the valuations of p sub x and p sub y. So, I just multiply them by alpha and beta and get the values of g at all the points, g prime the derivative of g at all the points in the space. Now, I have q evaluations of g and I have q more evaluations of g prime. This certainly is enough to recover the value of a degree 2 q polynomial. And so, we can reconstruct the value of the function from all the things when they are correct. What happens when I start having corruptions? Some fraction of values change? Not much. So, the things in red are what changed relative to the previous slide. So, now I am decoding with error. So, I have a function f which is usually equal to p, but not always. All of these things remain the same well, but I do not get the values of g everywhere on the line. I only get it for most points of the line. So, that means that the question of recovering the function g is no longer an interpolation question, it is a decoding question. 
it is a decoding question of the same algebraic vein and this paper actually gives you an algorithm to decode it all right. Uh, that is not all that we needed to do why because it is not good enough to recover the value of the function everywhere I also need to recover the value of its derivatives everywhere that is what was the message the encoding. So, if I want to recover the code word everywhere then I also have to recover all the derivatives p sub x and p sub y. Now one idea that does not work is to just say oh well you know p sub x is just another polynomial whose degree is at most d we just recovered a polynomial of degree at most d. But we recovered the polynomial from its values and the values of its derivatives I do not have the derivatives of p sub x waiting for me. So I cannot do that but there is a better idea which works out very nicely which is that well on the line L I actually recovered g as well as g prime I, you know once you give me g I can compute the derivatives so I can recover g prime as well g prime gives me evaluations of alpha times p sub x plus beta some p sub y on all the points in the line right I mean that was the definition that was how we used it in the past. Well if I have alpha times p sub x plus beta times p sub y at a b I can do the same idea pick another random line through a b and now I will get alpha prime times p sub x plus beta prime times p sub y for some new pair alpha prime and beta prime. If alpha beta is linearly independent of alpha prime beta prime then it is a linear 2 by 2 linear system which I can solve to compute p sub x and p sub y at a and b okay. So two lines and I get local decodability over here. So now we are actually done we have local decodability we have square root of n queries okay. So what else can we hope for over here you can uh, now this is only giving you bait rate one half you got up to rate close to two thirds but we did not get to rate one how do you go to rate 1 and how do you get better locality. So first let us fix the locality you want some more locality okay fine increase the number of variables this is what we always used to do to increase the number of variables and you can do it now get your locality down to as much as as little as you want. Now that you fix the locality you ask the question how much of a rate do you want and you increase the number of multiplicities you take the second derivatives and you take the third derivatives and you take the s derivatives and you use them all and uh, the rate starts going up to 1 it is remarkable I mean just you just sort of choose these parameters freely and you get whatever you want. The paper actually has a bunch of very neat algebraic ideas to supplement all this but I think this is good enough as a point to stop with the paper. So we are done with the proof I will do a couple of concluding thoughts and then uh, wrap up. Now I never defined what derivatives are in these slides you have copies and you will find out what derivatives are so I do not want to tell you what they are but it is a very simple nice concept. Uh, one of the very interesting things I mean we had been working with derivatives of polynomials for a while now about 10 years we have been looking at it and staring at these things trying to do different things with them analytically a realization that never came to me till now is that derivatives are not locally computable look if the derivatives were locally computable then there is no point giving you derivatives of the polynomial in addition to the values of the polynomial right. But on the other hand when you think about calculus how do you define the derivative is the value of the function here minus the value of the function there divided by something that is a two local computation but it does not work I mean it is it is not uh, any point along the sequence that I care about it is the limiting point and the limiting point actually is not uh, locally computable and that is something that is being used in a very positive way over here. Uh, so it is kind of you know you say well here is something which is kind of looks bad about the derivatives and that is absolutely the thing that makes it very 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 useful over here. Okay. So this is a sort of I, I find it very interesting and so on. So one of the things that has been going on in the past uh, 10 years or so is we have seen increasing uses of this multiplicities of polynomials derivatives of polynomials and multiplicities. And uh, the thing that it tends to do always has been that it allows you to work with higher and higher and higher degree polynomials than we previously were able to work with. Uh, we would love to see more applications of this and, and also to get a better understanding of why this is happening I have sort of been complaining about this for a while uh, nobody has risen to this challenge of trying to explain to me why are these actually a good thing to be doing why was it a good thing to encode include the derivatives of this polynomial uh, in various computations. Uh, and another very interesting theme that has been going on uh, starting from the work of uh, some Fox 2005 I think Parvarish and Vardy 
and then work of Guru Swami and Rudra and so on. There have been increasing examples of very, very, very algebraic codes which are not strictly speaking linear codes. Linear codes always had as their alphabet a finite field. These are all have as their alphabet a vector over a finite field. And these are turning out to be very useful algebraically. And I mean everything we did was algebra and yet we are working not over a finite field as an alphabet. And this is getting to be increasingly a, a, an interesting theme and I am sort of impressed by it. I would love to understand you know, what else can we do in this uh, regime. Now some questions back to so I mean this has all been very positive multiplicity codes are useful I want to get back to my negative traits. So uh, I would love to say for example that these codes are locally testable and why well amongst other things I would love to see probabilistically checkable proofs of these parameters I mean whose rate is just tinily more than the rate of the best possible proof. So I take a classical proof I extend it by a tiny amount get a probabilistically checkable proof which I can check with some linear number of queries. Now even defining this question is very subtle since I did define PCPs I won't be able to do that uh, here but uh, I think there exists a very nice definition but we don't have a clue on how to make that construction uh, how to make get constructions of that type I think it will be a very nice uh, thing to do. And uh, finally uh, you know so yes there is no rate barrier so when are we going to start seeing this in devices that is an interesting question. Okay, thank you. Oh from some intuition for what the Hasse derivatives are actually one does not need intuition you can just sort of you can ask the question what do I want from this derivative you look at the Schwartz Zippel lemma okay or, or just look at this question you know if I have a univariate polynomial what should it mean to say some point A is an mth root of it uh, you know is a, is a sth root sort of says x minus a to the power of s divides this polynomial. You look at that expression you stare at it in a couple of different ways the definition becomes pretty obvious what the derivative should be and that is roughly how it is uh, done in our papers. It is a very simple algebraic uh, expression it is very naturally motivated and uh, seems to have I mean properties which are nice simple but nothing very subtle about it. One thing I would say is okay derivatives the one tricky thing about derivatives and these Hasse derivatives why Hasse derivatives why are they different from any classical derivatives is the classical derivative you think of the second derivative of a function with respect to x is the first derivative of the first derivative does not happen with Hasse derivatives and that is again a very very good thing because if you take the second derivative of any polynomial over g of 2 to the k it is 0 in the in the classical sense the first derivative will have only even degree uh, monomials and the second derivative will be 0. Hasse derivatives do not have this property so yes you can actually use second derivatives and third derivatives and do something interesting. So that is where these things become very nice and useful.